So pundits proclaim that 2016 will be the year of virtual reality with the consumer delivery of Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, and the Sony PlayStation Morpheus. So when you look at that, you think that's really a high level of investment. But when you look at the AR, VR landscape, it looks more like this. There are lots and lots of people active in this. It's much greater than the three platforms that we just saw their devices are going to come to market this year. And all of that activity is projecting to be a $150 billion industry. And it's a combination of new frontier, arms race, and it has Wild West overtones where everyone's looking to stake a claim with a proprietary platform device or delivery mechanism. The lowest common denominator is your own phone. You know, you just pull your phone out of your pocket, you go to YouTube, you go to their 360 channel, you hold your phone up and you can move it around and see content in 360 dimensions. Put that phone in a simple cardboard sleeve and you can serve up stereoscopic content if you add binaural sound through earbuds or headphones, you're as close to an immersive experience as you can achieve without shelling up out a couple of thousand dollars on a head-mounted display, a computer with a strong enough graphics card, a fast enough processor, and a large enough um, hard drive. Yet technology is simply packing and code if there's no content. And to the storytellers, Toronto Studio Secret Location wins awards, exceeds client expectations and astounds audiences by telling the most powerful of stories in this emerging medium. It's my great pleasure to introduce Stefan Gambert and Josh Manrix of Secret Location. And I think you have to kind of get out of here. I don't know how you get out of here. I think I got it. Very good, you do it, you drive. Oh dear. I have no mouse. <laughs> what? There we go. Awesome. Hi. Uh, so we're here today to talk about virtual reality, creativity, and technology. Um, before we start, uh, let's talk a little bit about who we are. Um, my name is Steph Grambart. I am the creative director, or a creative director, at Secret Location. And uh, Josh Manrix is uh, our uh, associate technical director. Um, and yeah, we work at uh, Secret Location, like Nigel said, uh, where we uh, swore an oath to never actually reveal the location, uh, which is a lie. We are here in Toronto, uh, where we have a studio in Queen West, and we also have a satellite office in Los Angeles. And what we do uh, is we are a content studio for emerging platforms. And uh, what that means is that uh, we have a business that focuses on three main verticals. Uh, we like to work with established brands and properties. Uh, we focus on entertainment and story. Uh, and we like to apply new technology or we like to innovate on existing platforms. Uh, and when those three verticals connect, uh, that's really where our sweet spot is. So over the years, we've done a lot of work uh, with brands and properties that span film and television, both in Canada and the US. We also extend that into the advertising and commercial work, uh, and more importantly, into original IP, which uh, we will be talking about a little bit later. Uh, so we've enjoyed a lot of its success, uh, and this model has helped us uh, get honored with awards and recognition for efforts. And uh, before we go further, I'm just going to show a very quick reel. I hope this works on this screen in this bright room, but we'll see. And sound. Hold on. Uh, yep. Sorry, everybody. Technology. It's, it's something we're usually really good at, except for in the middle of presentations when it matters. Uh, HDMI. Here we go again. Send it. We're watching you.
this place. It is not safe. Stay quiet. So back in 2013, um, we had received our Kickstarter-backed Oculus uh, dev kit. So that was the Oculus Rift development kit number one. Uh, and we were actively looking for a VR project that we could sell through. Uh, but there really were a lot of challenges with that that we perceived. Uh, virtual reality was really, really new tech at the time. Um, and exactly how new, well, uh, the Kickstarter wasn't entirely fulfilled yet. There were a lot of people who were still waiting on their D DK1s. Uh, we were eight months out from the release of the second development kit, which really pushed the technology forward, and that's for Oculus. Uh, and it would be a year before Samsung, Facebook, or Google were even involved in the conversation. And honestly, just mentioning uh, VR got us a lot of really confused looks from people because they were still thinking about this being the technology that had given us the virtual boy, which wasn't really the greatest for cinematic or entertainment um, experiences. But that's nothing new to us, and we're used to talking to, to clients and partners about new technology, because it, this is really the type of project that we love to do. Um, and it's interesting, because selling through these concepts is almost equally as, as, as difficult as developing them or solving technical problems along the way. But we were lucky. Um, Fox TV was really open and interested to this idea. They had approached us about um, promoting uh, the second season of their show, Sleepy Hollow. Sleepy Hollow was a, had just wrapped up its first season and was a surprise hit for them. Uh, and they were a really great client. They were really willing to take a risk on this new technology. They thought it was exciting, and they were happy to just sort of go through the motions with us to figure out what this thing could be. So we're going to take a look at this project. Um, so the platforms that we released it on were the uh, Oculus Rift. At, again, at that point, there was no commercial release for this project. It was going to be an installation at uh, San Diego Comic-Con. So later on, we also had the DK2 and Gear VR ports. It was pretty heavy on this concept because we had to figure out what kind of a creative story we could tell in VR. Prototyping, obviously very high because we had never done a, a VR experience before. Uh, and then about 50% film and CG because we actually were gonna film an actor in 3D and put that performance into a CG environment, which had never been done before. And three meatball salads because when you're in San Diego and you're eating convention food for four days, a delicious meatball sal salad can really make your day. Uh, Rustic Tapas and Meatballs is not a sponsor or affiliated with the secret location in any way. So um, the tech we used. Uh, Sleepy Hollow was built using Unity uh, and we had uh, Blender 3D assets and all the uh, footage that we, we shot of our actor was done on a custom camera rig which was this sort of kit-bashed pair of GoPro cameras put together into a hard drive casing. Uh, at the time, there were th professional 3D cameras, but they were all designed for widescreen for uh, cinema. And the problem with that is that you can't get the, the right aspect ratio, because in, in a cinema, you have a frame. There, it, there's a, a screen that things can get cut off with. But in VR, you need to be able to see uh, the subject from head to toe, because if you look down in VR, there's no frame, right? So if the person's feet hasn't, haven't been filmed, they're not there and he's just a floating torso. Uh, and there were no GoPro rigs yet. They're all over the place now. You can buy 3D printed ones, but we didn't have access to that, so we literally had to make our own. So it all came together uh, at San Diego Comic-Con International in 2014 in San Diego. Uh, and we had to design this as way more than just a VR application. Uh, we knew that there was going to be a massive crowd of people in the hot sun in San Diego, and we needed to know how we could get them through this covered bridge, which uh, Fox had developed for a New York Comic Con earlier that year, and they were going to transplant to San Diego for us to put all the VR stuff in. 
So once we had the uh, detailed plans for this bridge, uh, we set about planning this user walkthrough. And we factored in things like the lineup, uh, the optimal time in experience, and then how we could promote this with social reach. So we had to get through a compelling story in less than two minutes, 90 seconds to be exact. Uh, and we realized that this is how we were gonna be able to get as many people through as possible and still give them something that was interesting. So we had to figure out how are we gonna tell not only a story in VR, but how are we gonna do that in 90 seconds. So we wrote a short script and then we moved to traditional storyboards to help map out uh, what we considered to be the best user experience. Uh, but it didn't really do uh, the job justice because obviously the audience can look away. Um, like I said before, it's a frameless experience, which means it's, there's no screen to look at. The story's happening all around you. Um, and what we learned was in VR, and this was definitely gonna be a lot of people's first experience with VR, there's this thing that we, we talk about as being the um, acclimation period and we knew that visitors needed to acclimatize to their surroundings. So if you can imagine you're all sitting here in this audience now, you're all having a 3D, 360 experience. This is more what VR is like than film or video games. Like things are happening around you, you're in a place. So to, to move, a, move someone from one place to another, and in our case, from San Diego inside of a, a covered bridge into this graveyard for Sleepy Hollow, uh, it's a bit disconcerting and it takes a little bit of time to get used to, so we needed to sort of let people explore the area around them just by looking around before we started the story. And then we knew that we also needed to let them or, or direct them back to the story. So we used this thing called leading action. Uh, so we had a crow in the experience and the crow sort of cause and because our sound is, is positional in 3D, um, you can hear it behind you if you're not looking at it. It sort of pulls your attention towards it and then the crow flies off and he flies off in the direction where our, our main actor comes in and then gives his performance. So as we were starting to talk about this, we said, okay, well, how, how are we gonna plan that? How are we gonna plan this whole thing out? And that's where we sort of took this idea of the storyboard and combined it with um, traditional animation, which is my background. Uh, we applied it with uh, location design and we created this sort of three, three, 360 storyboard. So we used this throughout the experience. At first it was just sort of like a plan for what what the environment looked like and what was happening where, but we ended up using it for sound and for everything else because everything happens in this 360 space around you. Um, and then as we were developing all these things, we said we need to start prototyping. So the first thing we did is we prototyped the shoot because we knew that shooting in stereoscopic was gonna be difficult. Like I said before, there were a lot of different cameras that we tried out, did a lot of different iterations. So we learned things like the right distance to be away from the, from the subject, um, you know, focal length, that sort of thing. And also we learned that our project manager uh, isn't a very great actor, but he definitely is an inexpensive one. You shouldn't be here, wherever here is. Look out behind you. Sorry, Luke. <laughs> Sorry, Luke. Um, so uh, filming stereoscopically, um, there's a lot of of issues with it, and the, one of the biggest pitfalls is the idea that uh, it locks the audience's position. So this was something that we, because we were doing VR very nascently, we didn't know, nobody was talking about these things, there weren't labels for things yet, but now people talk about uh, positional tracking and directional tracking. So when you shoot stereoscopically, you're, tr you're locked to directional tracking, which means that the head can, can look in any direction, 360, up and down, uh, but you can't move your head. You can't move your body in space because as soon as you do that, the recording is done just like your eyes record uh, vision. So if you move, it, it breaks the illusion of VR and, and will make you throw up instantly. Um, so uh, what this is showing here is uh, the version of Luke in the background uh, that was shot with, at, as close as we could get with a uh, professional 3D camera. Um, and the one that's closer to us is the one that we got from our GoPro sort of like hacked together rig. And as you can see, uh, Luke's pointing hand is, there's barely any depth data or depth visible in the, in the further one, but in the foreground one, it's a little bit better. Um, so what we've learned is the longer the distance away uh, that the subject is, the less depth you get and the less, um, uh, the less compelling the image becomes. We also learned things like with the DK1, the resolution was still so low that the further uh, away uh, your actor is, the, you're getting basically four pixels to that face and there's literally no um, performance being captured. 
So after we finally got our footage with uh, Tom Meissen, who plays Ichabod Crane in the show, um, we now had to start to figure out how we were going to in integrate that into CG. And one of the main issues was how we're going to do uh, traditional post-production VFX. So this shot here, and I'm probably going to have to rewind it, but on the left you can see just the still, and on the right is uh, sort of this... Uh, down, there we go. So on the right, that tracking information is something that, that our director of motion, Steve Miller, created. And what, it did, what he did was he was able to track points on this lantern that then he could translate between the two, the left and the right eye image, and translate that into um, depth data. And then we could create a glow in CG and then apply it to the, the lantern. So we were actually tracking depth on a 2D image. And that helped us sort of sync all our assets together. Um, so while we were doing all this, uh, Josh started developing with free assets from the Unity store. So we wanted to keep, keep things moving forward and work iteratively. So this sort of led to this creation of a complete experience from the start, and we could start testing it. So what you see here is one of the sort of works in progress. Most of these assets are from, from Unity. They're free assets on the store. They're really great to use. So as a developer, Josh could just throw things in, not really have to worry about what things look like, and just sort of position them. Obviously, there's um, uh, the first footage of Tom Meissen in there, and then the model of the uh, Headless Horseman, which we got from Fox. So now what we could do is we could test, we could get people through the experience, find out where it was breaking story-wise and technology-wise, and then we could just keep iterating on the graphics. So this eventually turned into this. Um, we could see little issues of, uh, arise as things started to come together which then allowed us to fix small problems over time rather than let them become larger issues towards the end of the, the development cycle. Uh, so I'm gonna play the actual experience now so you guys can watch it. Should be good. You should not be here. This place. It is not safe, but the dividing line between brave and foolhardy is but a sliver. My name is Ichabod Crane, and you, I take it, are not from around here, or you would not brave the streets of Sleepy Hollow after dark. Shh. Did you hear that? I fear my greatest enemy approaches. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, the avatar of death itself. Do exactly as I say. Stay where you are. In the dark, in the fog, he might not detect you. I shall circle round to the street, cause a distraction, try to lure him away. Keep your wits about you and stay quiet. Your very life depends on it. Sorry, yeah, a little bit dark there. <laughs> Thank you. So at the end of uh, the experience, uh, our partners at Fox TV were super happy with the results. Uh, they took a really big risk on VR because Sleepy was this first of, it, of its kind for a film or television property, being able to combine CG with an actor's live performance. Uh, and obviously, um, the actor's live performance was something that they were very sensitive about. They wanted to make sure that, that, was, like, that it captured authenticity. Uh, rather than being something that was just like a CG recreation of that character. Um, and the creators of the Sleepy Hollow uh, property were, were also really happy about it. Fans were engaged at uh, SDCC, uh, there was a lot of press coverage, uh, and we had basically proven a model for cinematic VR, uh, which eventually uh, led to uh, the uh, first ever primetime Emmy for a virtual reality experience. Uh, for outstanding creative achievement in interactive media, user interface, and visual design, which is like the longest thing to put on a, on a trophy. But uh, there was no category for VR, and they, the, the Academy basically said, you guys have sort of innovated here and created something that no one else has for TV and film before. So, uh, yeah. And honestly, 
Uh, Emmys is a very strange experience, uh, amazing as well. Um, our director of motion who was there with us took this uh, 360 panorama. Uh, and if, if you're wondering what has got my attention, uh, it's, it's probably this guy, um, which kind of outlines, this is obviously a 360 panorama photo, uh, that but it outlines some of the issues that we have with stitching and to talk about our next project, which involves live footage and stitching. I'm going to get Josh to come up here. Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so yeah, that was our first foray into, into VR. And um, I guess fast forward to uh, six months ago uh, when we decided to try and make uh, a, a VR uh, film clip movie. Um, and we were going to do it live, film, do the filming live for a rock band, um, for a rock band called Pop Evil. Uh, so the, the project breakdown sort of looked like this. It was going to be all 3D 360 filmed footage uh, for the Oculus Rift, the Gear VR, and then uh, because we're, we're in 2016, we can, we can push it to YouTube 360 now as well, and to Facebook. Uh, again, high level, uh, high amount of concepting, a low, amount of prototyping, uh, just because we'd done a lot of sort of uh, 360 stitching before, so we knew how that was gonna go. And then obviously, or maybe not obviously, um, stitching 360 video is time consuming. Uh, stitching 3D 360 video is like five to 10 times more time, con time consuming because you need to line up both eyes uh, to get the 3D image to look right. Uh, and obviously, uh, a ton of beers because it's rock and roll. Uh, so this is what the technology stack looked like for this one. Obviously a big upgrade in our 3D camera here. We have a, three, uh, a 3D 360 uh, 3D printed camera rig. Uh, I think this one held 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 GoPro cameras. So that's uh, two, f two for each angle that it's viewing because you have one for each eye, left eye, right eye. Uh, we use Colorize and Autopano Giga to stitch and preview the 3D 360 stuff. Um, it's free, you can download it today, it's, it's super good. Uh, so we really wanted to capture the energy of a rock concert experience uh, like never before, and to sort of, to put the viewer in a position where they could never be as just a regular punter at a, at a gig. And that was up on stage with the band, next to the singer, behind the drummer, next to the drummer, and then down in the actual mosh pit as well. Uh, so, Again, pre-production planning. Uh, we had a few ideas on how we were, how we thought we could, we could sort of stitch it together or tell the story. Uh, so we figured, you can do that all right? Okay. Uh, so we'd frame the shots in a 360 uh, degree fashion where members of the band would stand around the rig and they'd all be there and you'd be able to look around. But that, doesn't really, it's not really conducive to like a live stage performance. Maybe if we were filming in a studio, that would have worked. But they were on stage performing live to, to a crowd, so that really wasn't going to work. Um, and so we tried like the close, tried to do some sort of a clothesline effect where uh, the band members would walk across stage, and because the camera was in the middle of the stage, they'd be constantly passing through and walking around you. So in the final experience, the band would essentially be like circling around you during the experience. Um, and then another approach um, that we thought might work that we called vertical blinds, uh, where we'd stitch together two alternate slices from 360 environments. So uh, we'd have a stereo pair pointing, uh, let's say, directly at the drummer, and then another stereo pair positioned down in the pit directly at the, uh, the audience, and then another one uh, on the front of the stage pointing directly at the singer as he was going along. And then we'd we could stitch those different pieces together. So as you looked around, you'd be looking at the crowd and then at the drummer and then at the singer. Uh, made a little plan where we're gonna stick our cameras. We, uh, this is probably one of the, the most uh, sort of technically challenging shoots that we've done. It's like, it's a live event, it's in the middle of summer. Uh, it's a rock band that are very high energy moving around the stage and we wanted to capture as much, that, as, much as that energy as we could. Um, and then another sort of technical limitation is of these camera rigs is that uh, the heat combined with GoPro cameras means that 
And also filming at 60 frames per second means that the, uh, the battery life on the cameras isn't that long. You probably get like 30 minutes of filming max. And it's not like you can walk out on stage and switch these cameras out. It's actually quite fiddly to get them in and out of the rig. So it was really just like one shot you had. And so we wanted to get as much coverage as we could. So we rolled with five different cameras. Um, here's a better shot of uh, one of the rigs that we were using. Um, obviously, the limitations of the shoot that we can't be out there on stage with them moving the cameras around, so we had to really plan um, how we were gonna do that. Uh, another sort of limitation of filming in stereoscopic 3D is that you're in a locked position, so unlike Sleepy Hollow where you could move your head because it was sort of 3D generated, you're filming from a single position, so as, in, as soon as you move your head sideways like that, it breaks the 3D illusion because the cameras are pointing like that, so they're mimicking your eyes. Um, thanks, Steph, that's great. <laughs> um, so we wanted also to get up close and personal with the crowd, so we had a stereo pair put on like a little gimbal rig and uh, sent, a, sent a camera guy down into the pit with people as well uh, to really, and that was, it, that footage actually turned out really great. Um, it's, it's super like immersive stuff. You really feel like you're down there and you can feel the energy of the crowd just going crazy during the set. Uh, so I'm not familiar, I'm not sure how, familiar people are with like sort of the process of stitching 3D or three, 360 video. Uh, with those camera rigs, you have 10 cameras in them and you, t you, you rip all the sort of the footage off them and you stitch it back together. And this is what the image looks like initially when you stick it together. This has probably had about a day's worth of work done on it. Um, and I've just thrown in some lines there to sort of show you each sort of square there is a different camera, is different footage covered from a different camera. And you can notice that uh, along the top there, or maybe you can probably see it, uh, along the top is a lot darker, and then in the middle is a lot more light, and then on the bottom is a lot darker. And even through like vertical slices, there's different color grading through them. So that's one of the big issues uh, with, I guess, GoPro cameras as well, is that uh, you're getting different light sources bouncing on them because they're facing different directions. So you could have shots that are backlit, shots that are frontlit, um, and that affects the way that you stitch these things together. Um, and once you do get a good stitch, uh, the image ends up looking like this. This is from a, a camera that we put directly on stage filming towards the singer. And uh, because it's 360, you get the crowd in the background as well. So when you wrap that around, the one direction you're looking at the singer, you turn back around and you're looking direct, you're standing on stage looking back out on, onto this massive crowd, which is fantastic. Um, another part of this uh, project was we didn't want to just do like a plain video recording because uh, we've seen a bunch of those done before and it, while it's sort of cool, it's not really high energy enough for sort of a rock, a rock performance. So uh, we wanted to try something a little bit new and to uh, try and comp in uh, stereo images from other rigs into a 360 uh, environment. So in this shot here, you can see at the top in the middle, uh, well, let's just take a step back. The 360 shot is uh, up behind the drummer. You can sort of see him like half on the left there, half on the right, so when we stitch it around, he gets whole. So the camera is there next to the drummer, looking out across the crowd, and then we've comped in uh, some of the singer and some of the crowd from, two, from 3D uh, images to fill the sky as well. So when you're in the experience, it feels like the singer is this massive sort of godlike figure that's in 3D above the crowd singing back at you. It's a really cool effect. Uh, the second part to this whole uh, project was how do we actually distribute this to people? Sure, we can put it up onto, uh, onto Google Play and stuff like that, uh, but we needed to build our own sort of video streaming solution. Uh, so the tech department came up with this product called Stanley, named Stanley after Stanley Kubrick. Um, it's a cross-platform virtual reality sort of CMS, and we wrote a lot of custom sort of 3D shading co code uh, to help distribute the video. Traditionally, well, I say traditionally, but like two years ago, uh, 
people would just wrap a video on a sphere, on a 3D sphere, and put that essentially around your head, so you'd have this video playing back. Uh, it's super sort of heavy from the tech side on a mobile phone. Heats your phone up really quickly and uh, chews down the battery really fast. Uh, so we took a different approach to that. Rather than using polygons, uh, we created a custom fragment shader. So the sphere would have upwards of 1,000 polygons or whatever. Uh, the custom shader has two polygons, so immediately you see the reduction in the amount of processing power needed. Um, one of the other advantages of the technology that we sort of found was that we could review cuts and share them with people in 3D as well. So we could let people download the app and it, it would just update with the latest cuts from the video. Um, and then the content management system uh, uploaded into there and then it can push out to different uh, distribution platforms directly from the one video. So it pushes out to the iOS store, the Android store, Oculus Home, Samsung Gear VR, uh, also uh, it can output directly to YouTube and it can put a video out that you can then upload to Facebook as well. So that project was very much the closest to traditional filming as you can get. The Sleepy Hollow project was sort of a mashup of both of them. We had 3D and we had stereoscopic filming. Um, and those two projects were probably two years apart. Uh, and so if we fast forward again another, another year, uh, the release of RuneScale VR became a thing, so you can interact with stuff, you can move around, um, and which leads me to the third case study that we have, um, a new property that we'll be coming out with later in the year called Blasters of the Universe. It's a first-person shooter in VR designed for touch controls and for room scale. Uh, so it's going to be launching on the HTC Vive, and let's just take a quick look at uh, the project breakdown for this one. So the platforms will be HTC Vive and Oculus Touch. Obviously, it's another step above what we've been talking about previously. Both those, pro those projects were sort of more passive experiences where things are happening around you and you're just watching and you're experiencing it. Uh, with the addition of room scale and touch, you're much more involved. It's more, you're more engaged with it and you can affect what happens in the world as well. So high level concepting, high level of prototyping, very low level of, of film and stitching, um, I'll talk a little bit about that, that, about that later, and um, a high amount of CG and two lawnmowers, uh, lawnmower men. Uh, so the, the, um, the tech uh, stack breakdown would have looked, looked something like this. Unity, Substance Painter, Maya for 3D modeling, and of course HCC Vive. Um, for those of you that haven't experienced the HCC Vive before, it's, a, it's the highest level of immersion that you can get in consumer VR products. It launched, it launched earlier this year. It's not cheap. I think it's like 1,200 US dollars, which is like 6 million Canadian. Um, so it's pretty expensive. You also need a really high-powered computer uh, to run it, and they retail for pretty much the same price again of this headset, around $1,500. Um, but what you do get with that is the ability to walk around within VR, pick stuff up, touch things, throw stuff. Um, it's super immersive. Uh, so, again, with all the projects, we started with a concepting phase of what, what is this world going to look like um, in VR, what could it possibly be? And we were trying to go for, we'd done a lot of realistic looking stuff before with traditional filming and uh, the Sleepy Hollow project, which we tried to go as realistic as we can with the 3D, as opposed to this one, which was very much based in like a fantastical VR world, like what in, it's a world that can never exist in, re in, in real life, and I think that's one of like, the great things about VR, that we can create these fantastical worlds and like, exist inside them. So more concepting and sort of refining the look. Uh, but all the time, we were thinking about how to best utilize touch controllers. Um, and so because it's a first-person shooter, you're, you have a hand with a gun in it, and then what do you do with this other hand? Um, here's a little gift from an early prototype. So. In one hand, uh, we're firing gun, and in the other hand, we're using to reload it. So you can actually pick things up. You pull the trigger, and it spawns another magazine, and then you can put it onto the gun like that. Um, here's another little gif of um, something that uh, is really fun in VR is just to throw things, um, which was surprising. Uh, and we thought about why is it so fun, and I guess we just came to the conclusion that, like, you don't get to throw things every day in your real life. Like, you can't just walk into your kitchen and throw a bunch of stuff on the ground because there's repercussions to that. Um, in VR, you can throw things all day and just put the headset on and walk away. 
Uh, there's a great experience called Job Simulator, if anybody's ever seen that. And it's the most, if you were to do those things in real life, it's the most mundane things like photocopying and pouring a cup of coffee or working, uh, making hot dogs. But once you put it into VR and you're able to fill a cup of coffee and throw it across the room and watch it smash and turn back around and pick up another cup of coffee and throw it again, it's fantastic. It's, it's so good. Um, so that was one of the big things that we were trying to overcome. Uh, we're trying to prototype and see what felt good. Uh, the second part of that is room scale, so being able to actually move around inside VR. Um, the HTC Vive, this is the extent of its room scale, so a three meter by four meter uh, square, and you can move freely within, within that area. Uh, so how we were gonna like, utilize that back within the Blasters sort of game world, um, we give you the ability to, to move around. You can also, and we've slowed down the enemy shooting at you so you can essentially bullet time every single shot if you wanted to dodge out of the way, watch the shot go past you, which makes you, it makes you feel like you're in, your movie, you're in a movie and it's super, you feel like a superhero, essentially. So we have these things and you're all looking at these GIFs and you're like, cool, I don't, but it's really hard to know what it actually feels like to do these things. A 2D image, like traditional film, doesn't really get it across. It's like, so we're thinking, what's the best way to make a VR, to make a promo video for VR? Um, and we'd seen some stuff some other people had done and the best sort of analog that we found was like a mixed reality record. So um, we actually tried to hack together this mixed reality record on a green screen. So it's essentially real-time comping of the game world with a green screened uh, person playing the game. Uh, so, and the way that you go about doing that is, so we have uh, a HTC Vive controller on the, on the right there, strapped to the top of the camera, and that Vive controller is tracked within 3D space uh, in the room scale. So we create a virtual camera, and it's a one-to-one -one analog with the real camera because we have that tracker on top. So when we move that tracker in real space, it moves the virtual camera in the game world at the same time. And then on the other side there, we have uh, one of our employees playing the game. And uh, here's a little video it's like a time lapse, a two minute time lapse of an early prototype up until the gameplay of what that actually looks like. I don't think it has any sound. So this is a very early prototype where you can see the green screen there comped out and the game world in the background and we're sort of doing some tests, doing some depth tests here um, to see whoop, what feels good. And we're just trying to, using blocks and seeing how accurate we can get it uh, placing blocks around into 3D space. And then obviously the second part of that is like forwards and backwards depth. If I, there's one point where I move my head into the cube in virtual space and it comes out the other side in, in real space. I might just skip a bit forward. It kind of gets, so this is like a higher fidelity sort of version of it where we're trying to put boxes in front of people and see see if we can get that tracking. The tracking isn't exactly 100%, and so this is more in the game world now. It's a little bit easier to understand how it's going. So he's holding the controller, and the gun was obviously in front of him, and as he turns around and fires, um, you'll be able to see. I'll skip a bit forward here. So a reverse camera angle now, where the camera is behind him, and that's in the virtual space. And we can move things in that virtual space in real time as well. Shooting blocks, it's never been so rewarding. And so that was an early prototype of what we did. And it, I think it gets the idea across a lot, a lot better than just a flat filmed uh, GIF or, or a trailer, a traditional trailer.